What's good, Knicks Nation? Welcome back to another Game of the Week preview. We're previewing Game 4 of the New York Knicks facing off against the Philadelphia 76ers. They will be at the Wells Fargo Arena on Sunday at 1 p.m. All right. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. And with me today to help preview this game is none other than Adam Aronson. He covers the Philadelphia 76ers for the Philly Voice. Let's get into this. Adam, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thank you for coming through. Uh, you know, I sent you a, I sent you a message last night. I'm, pre- I'm appreciative of you for responding last minute, late at night. It was just a hectic day, just trying to get through of everything. So I appreciate you for coming through and helping me preview this game. And I guess just to start off with, what have you thought about the series so far? Um, well, well, going in, I really had trouble kind of like, you know, people always ask, oh, who do you think wins the Sixers, the series, the Sixers, the Knicks? And ultimately, I lean the Knicks very slightly. But my only real take was just that I thought the series was going to go seven games and I thought it was going to be really competitive. Um, and I still kind of think that's where we're headed. Uh, obviously, that would have been a lot tougher had had the Sixers not not pulled it out on Thursday night in game three. But um yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun for me just to watch, you know, all the adjustments that are being made, seeing all the different ways the Knicks are trying to cover Embiid, seeing everything Nick Nurse is trying to do to limit Brunson. And, you know, obviously both of those guys struggled a lot relative to what we usually see from them in the first two games and then both kind of broke out in game three. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, again, how how both coaches adjust to those two superstars, you know, going off in game three and and then how those guys respond to whatever different looks they're seeing. Absolutely. It's been a complete chess match so far from both Tom Thibodeau and Nick Nurse in each of these matchups. But as a Knicks fan and someone who covers this team, uh, you know, it's it gives me confidence seeing that Jalen Brunson was able to come through in game three, even though you got a stellar performance from Joel Embiid. He dropped 50 points. I know he went to the line 21 times, but still 50 points is 50 points. And that's kind of what he's been able to do. He's been able to average more points than minutes during the regular season when he's been healthy. And look, He's been he's been phenomenal prior to the injury. He was good against the Knicks in game three. But as a Knicks fan, just to see like if it took 50 points and Jalen Brunson and the rest of the team were going as a Knicks fan and someone who, like I said, covers this team. I'm confident of this team going into game four just because of I don't know. I look at the role players and I think and you let me know what you thought, because I've talked to a lot of people who cover the 76ers and. They say that, you know, you look at Philly, they got one, two right there, and Embiid, Maxi. then it would be Brunson and everybody else talent-wise for the New York Knicks that falls, falls after. What would you think about that type of statement, hearing that type of – about the talent-wise for both teams? Yeah, I, I certainly uh, – you know, when I was when I was thinking about the playoff series, like I said earlier, usually when – you know, I'm kind of torn about who's going to win a series. I I just lean towards the team with the best player. And obviously Jalen Brunson is incredible. Nick Nurse called him a legitimate MVP candidate before the series started. I, you know, I agree with him. He's, he's I know he's not going to win the award, but obviously what he's done this year and in the last two years since he's gotten to the Knicks is incredible. And, you know, I've gotten to watch him for a long time, even, even before he was with the Knicks. Um, but Embiid is the best player in the series, even, even, Embiid, who let's say is 80 to 85 percent uh, or whatever, whatever he's going to be at moving forward. Um, so I definitely, uh, you know, kind of had to weigh that. Um, and, you know, and I th- and I do think Maxi is closer to Brunson than Brunson is to Embiid. Um, mm. I think at the same time, I do think there's a clear difference between Brunson and Maxi. I think, uh, you know, Maxi has learned a lot this year, especially when and be missed more than two months and, and missed more than half the regular season, um, starting to learn what it's like to be that number one guy. But we all know Jalen Brunson's been there and done that as far as being the lead option, especially since Randall went down. And, uh, you know, obviously, as, as you know, the Knicks, you know, the Knicks are one of the few teams that maybe suffered as many injuries and as much adversity with that as the Sixers this year. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think Embiid is the clear best player in the series and, and, you know, the same way that there's kind of a drop off with the Knicks and talent wise after Brunson, there's a very similar one with the Sixers after Embiid and Maxi. 
Um, though I do think, you know, I just have a lot more faith in the Dante DiVincenzo's and Josh Hart's of the world mm. than I do in, you know, let's say Tobias Harris, uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, which is not, not exactly a bold take after the last three games, but uh, you know, even like, like Kelly Oubre, who, who's been great as a sixer and has, and has filled several different roles throughout the year and deserves a lot of credit and deserves to finally get paid this summer. Um, you know, Nick Batum, who saved the Sixer season basically in the play in tournament game against the Heat last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kyle Lowry has been uh, wonderful and hugely valuable since he got to the Sixers. Uh, you know, we saw what someone like Campaign is capable of doing in game three. Um, but I do still, I still trust the Knicks role players more than I trust the Sixers role players. Okay. And, you know, I, I appreciate the, the kudos that you give Joe and Brunson because I do, you know, I would say that it's Embiid, Brunson, Maxi, and then it goes to the Knicks role players. Uh, that's how I would look at it as, as the ta- as the talent would line up if we're ranking them on paper. But moving along and, and talking about this, t- uh, just I guess last game in Game Three, it's still going on to this day. You see on Twitter that a lot of NBA, I guess the NBA is pulling back a lot of the footage of Embiid grabbing Mitchell Robinson's leg. I want to know, as somebody who covers the team on a day to day basis. What were your thoughts when you saw Embiid? I don't know if you've even had a clear view of Embiid grabbing Mitchell Robinson's legs, but what was your thoughts when you saw that happen? Yeah, so so media seating is actually behind one of the baskets at the Wells Fargo Center, and it was actually mm. that basket. So so I did have a pretty good view of it in real time. Um, so I don't think Embiid was being malicious. I don't think he was intending to injure Mitchell Robinson. Um, at the same time, I think what he did was both uh, it was it was reckless. Um, obviously, grabbing a player's leg is, has always been frowned upon in, in the NBA for at least as long as I can remember for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, it doesn't help that that Mitch is a guy who, you know, missed more than three months with after having ankle surgery and then ends up, you know, leaving the, the arena in a walking boot. Um, so, yeah, I didn't I didn't think that Joel was was trying to injure Mitchell Robinson. I just don't think that that's that's who Joel has been. Um First of all, but, you know, first of all, it was, it was obviously reckless. And I think the flagrant one was was more than deserved. And, and I wasn't surprised that it took the refs about 30 seconds to look at it and say, yeah, that's a flagrant foul. Um, I also think considering it was, you know, seven minutes into the game and Embiid already had one foul, like it was it was beyond the reckless part. I thought it was just kind of stupid. Like, dude, you're you're way too important to be getting into foul trouble in a game this big. Um so yeah, I don't I don't think Embiid, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it dirty, uh, but I would call it reckless. Mm. Uh, and you know, that's still inexcusable, especially in a game of that magnitude. Um, and you know, it could have, you know, I don't I, I haven't been able to pinpoint the exact like second, whether it was within that play or a later play mm-hmm. where Mitchell Robinson like really aggravated. Uh, you know, his foot or his ankle or whatever it was, obviously he was questionable before game three with the, you know, injury recovery, but uh, it was almost like uncomfortable to watch towards the end of the first half, Mitch, like hobbling up and down the court um, because Hartenstein was already in foul trouble. And, and you know, Tibbs thought he needed Robinson in the game, but he just couldn't move. And then, and then the Sixers clearly noticed it and Embiid scored on him a couple of times. And then, and then Robinson was done for the night. Um, you know, I certainly don't have to go on a Knicks podcast and talk about, you know, the potential that Mitch Robb has as a defensive player. And oh, how- we already know. We, we, we already know how important he is. Yeah. And how and how good he was in the first two games of the series, especially game one, where, where you could argue he kind of swung the game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, though Josh Hart, I guess, was the star of the night. But I think I think you get where I'm going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that could be a huge deal, uh, you know, moving forward in the series if he's. Uh, you know, I, I believe I saw he didn't practice for the Knicks today. Mm-hmm. Uh, if he if he misses tomorrow uh, or any other games in the series, obviously, you know, Precious issue was next in line and whatnot. Um, but yet to get back to your original question, um, I don't think I don't think what MB did was was malicious. I don't think he wanted to hurt Mitchell Robinson. I, I think uh, someone who has who has been uh you know, hurt obviously physically, but also mentally by injuries as much as Embiid. Uh, I just don't, I don't think that he's someone who wants to injure another player. And I think most NBA players don't, uh, obviously. Um, 
but also it was it was you know not only dumb to pick up your second foul early in the first quarter of a crucial game but uh you know it was also reckless to to grab at a guy's leg and cause him to fall onto the ground uh and and I will say that in that uh the reason Embiid missed more than two months with an injury um is that he hurt his meniscus after Jonathan Kaminga landed on his knee right and Embiid said after the game that he sort of had flashbacks in that moment where he thought Mitch Rob was going to land on his knee and that he thought he was protecting himself. I don't know if I, from, from my vantage point, it didn't look like Mitch Rob was going to land on him. Um, I'm going to take Joel at his word that that's what he thought. Um, but at the same time, uh, certainly there probably were smarter ways to handle that situation than the way Joel did. So yeah, uh, not dirty in my opinion, but uh, you know, not malicious, but, but reckless and, and still, not really excusable for me. So it's the next nation. Thank you for all tuning in for another game of the week preview. Once again, make sure you hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KSTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. And we got Adam Aronson on the other side who covers the Philadelphia 76ers for the Philly Voice. Adam, I, I hear what you're saying. I just, it's hard for me to believe that like I get where he's coming from with regards to wanting to protect himself, but I just didn't see Mitch going to land on him. He was going up for a putback dunk. Typically, these guys like they hang on the rim too before they come back. Then it seemed like he was out of the way. It just seemed like a, a quick reaction for a guy that was frustrated, in my opinion. That's how I looked at it as. And I've spoke about it on post game, spoke about it on other shows as well. Where I just, I it's just to me, I think reckless is the right term because we'll never know the mental state of where he was at and why he did it. But for a guy who's gone through injuries, I would have expected that you never grab somebody who's airborne jumping up. We just know the severity that the injuries could lead to. And that's why, you know, I, it, to me, man, it's still a dirty play. And I know Nick's nation still up, upset about what happened, but moving along from the Embiid injury, you know, we're looking at game four, game four is on the way. It starts tomorrow. Like I said, at 1 PM, what, are your thoughts going into game four? Is there anything that you see from a Nick Nurse coaching perspective or from a player standpoint, what needs to change for Philadelphia or if anything needs to change at all after just winning game three? Yeah. So, so from the Sixers perspective and, and, and I, I basically, you know, I've been throughout the playoffs writing, you know, before each game, you know, key, you know, what are the keys storylines going into each game? And, and you'll be able to read that for me going into tomorrow, tomorrow morning at phillyvoice.com if you want, you know, the the, perf- the perspective from, from the Philadelphia side. Um, and I always find myself thinking like, well, like the main thing is just always going to be Embiid in the playoffs because that's just mm-hmm. what it is. And, and people know, obviously, you know, people know how talented Embiid is and how ridiculously good he's been in the regular season, especially over the last three years. People also know that he's come up short in the playoffs many times over the last, you know, over the course of his whole career, really. Um, And, you know, he's going to have to do something similar to what he did in game three in a lot more important situations moving forward for the Sixers to get to where they want to go. But that was really, I thought, the most important game of Embiid's career in which he's really come through and just put his foot down and say, we're not losing this game. Um, and what's what's special about Embiid is that he has the ability to do that at any given moment. And that's why it's often so valuable to have the best player in a given playoff series. Um, so I think the biggest thing, at least from, you know, my perspective as someone who watches the Sixers every night is, you know, how is Embiid going to look particularly on offense? The defense with him is pretty much always great this time of year, um, but the offense can get shaky. So that's the first thing. Um, and the other thing, like, like I mentioned at the beginning is, uh, you know, the sort of trickiness that comes with defending Brunson um, and the fact that, you know, I, I believe he was like 16 of 45 from the field combined in games one and two. Mm-hmm. And then he drops 39 and 13 in game three. Um, I asked Nick Nurse after, after game three, like, you know, basically Brunson finally started to get going. Like, what did you see from him versus what you guys were doing and, and what needs to change? And, and basically all he said was like, he's an amazing player and we were never going to, you know, be able to stop him for an entire series the way that we did for two games. Um, he seemed completely, you know, not only not surprised, but sort of unfazed, like he expected Brunson to erupt, which I think is a testament to how good Brunson is. Um, 
So, so to me, you know, oftentimes in the playoffs, role players can swing games. We've seen that with mm-hmm. Josh Hart, even like what campaign did in game three was enormous. Um, you know, Mitchell Robinson helped swing game one, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but I do think ultimately it, it oftentimes, you know, more often than not, it's going to boil down to the superstars. Um, and we know who the two superstars are in the series. It's Joel Embiid and Jalen Brunson. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, what the Knicks do differently defensively against Embiid after he scored 50. And it's going to be interesting to see what, uh, you know, what the Sixers do against Brunson after his 39 and 13. Absolutely. And look, Brunson, you mentioned it. Embiid, even Maxi and Brunson, those guys are supposed to be the constant. Those guys are not supposed to change anything. Uh, not necessarily anything, change anything. They're not supposed to, they're supposed to be unfazed, right? They're supposed to go into any arena and be able to do what they do, which is to score, defend whatever their whatever their signatures are in these guys cases it's to def- it's to play offense at a very high level and to provide points and some playmaking so those guys are supposed to be your constant as you mentioned it's the role players role players usually perform better at home than on the road as we as is the case we've seen for the 76ers as soon as you go back to Wells Fargo game three campaign I know he didn't play much in the first two but comes right in becomes that jolt of energy hits critical threes when needed to put it on to another level. Even with Kyle, Kyle Lowry, he's hitting critical shots at times. Very efficient game from him in game three. Um, but obviously the big one was just Joel Embiid decided to become Steph Curry and just knock down four threes. Yep. You 12 points very quickly in the third quarter. And then you just look at, it was like a 40 plus point difference to 27. I think it was 43 to 27 in the third quarter. And that's all she wrote. It was too deep of a hole for the Knicks to clock Knicks uh to climb themselves back out of um so with that i i think for me going into this game i'm looking at once again Ken- kelly Oubre because he was very vital in game three too he actually showed up which you know he's been pretty quiet for games one and two from an offensive standpoint but doing a solid job defensively guarding brunson um so with that, do you see Ubre being the, I guess, X factor again, or do you see him being that, I guess, is he, does he have to be that guy again as he was in game three for the Sixers to come away with another victory in this matchup? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked about Kelly because, uh, you know, Nurse, Nurse talked before game three about like, yeah, Kelly has been unbelievable defensively on Brunson. He's guarded him for, you know, most of his minutes on the floor. I think he had five steals in game one, Um, you know, really like working his ass off on that end of the floor, but didn't really have much scoring to show for it, uh, which doesn't really jive with Kelly Oubre's reputation. I think when people think of him, they think about scoring, Um, especially, you know, when Embiid was out for two months, that was his main role with the Sixers was, was to score the ball. Um, and then, you know, Brunson finally got the best of him on Thursday. But, you know, Oubre had 15 points on six of eight shooting after I believe he only had 14 points combined in the first two games. Um, and I, uh, you know, I do these mailbags on, on phillyvoice.com throughout the playoffs, just, you know, answering people's questions and whatnot. And, and somebody asked me basically, um, you know, if someone, if a role player for the Sixers in this series, which basically means anyone other than Embiid and Maxi, if anyone is to like single-handedly win the Sixers a game in the, in the kind of way that Nick Batum did against the heat in the play in tournament last week, where he had six threes, 20 points was amazing defensively on Jimmy Butler and Tyler hero. Um, you know, Maxi was bad in the first half and bead was bad for 45 minutes of the game. And they still won largely because of Batum. Um, so something that was asked of me is, you know, if someone on the Sixers roster can do that in this Knicks series, who do you think it would be? And my answer was Ubre, um, just because I feel like he checks the most boxes among the Sixers role players of ways in which he can impact the game. Mm. Uh, everybody knows that he can get to the rim at a high level. He can finish when he gets there. He can get to the free throw line. Uh, there are nights where he's hot from three. I think he was two of four from three uh, in game three. Uh, you know, we've seen the defensive potential against Brunson. We've seen the way that he can, you know, not take – the other team's best player out of the game entirely, but really limit them. Um, and so Ubre was my answer. Um, I think he's a, he's a huge part of the Sixers moving forward. I think 
Uh, he was their their third most valuable player over the course of the regular season behind Embiid and Maxi in my eyes, um, which is kind of remarkable given he's on a minimum contract and Tobias Harris mm. is making $40 million. <laughs> but, but the, you know, the Tobias Harris contract thing is, is another story for another day. Um, Boy, so Tobias think, Harris, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off, but Tobias Harris has been catching a lot of strays. Everybody who I bring on to discuss the Sixers, it's Tobias yeah. Harris, Tobias Harris. And I get it, right, rightfully so, but there's not a show that I've done that has gone by without Tobias Harris catching that's a stray. How, that's how bad it's been, man. It's it's really brutal. It's uh, I really like can't uh, – like Sixers crowds are are usually great. Um, and, and you know, the Knick, Knicks fans almost took over the arena early in game three, which is a different discussion. But there's like – you know, no matter what happens, like Sixers fans generally are going to be into it. They're going to be loud. They're going to be, you know, like obviously they'll boo guys when they're not playing well and, and they're known for that. But like there's just like a, a collective groan that happens like every time <laughs> Tobias like catches the ball and looks off a pass and then posts up with 10 seconds left on the shot clock and dribbles for seven seconds and doesn't get by his man and takes some fade away long two that doesn't go in and everybody's just like oh my god he's doing it again and and he's been here for more than five years now and i think it's worn off on everybody and and maybe he's included in that and i think i think i think all parties would be would be better off if, if he leaves in free agency this summer um so yeah the, the tobias thing is is very real in terms of the you know sort of angst that exists surrounding him but uh, yeah, I think to, to get back to your original question, I, I do think uh, I think Oubre will be pivotal for the Sixers if they want to win this series. Um, you know, obviously the uh, the defense on Brunson through two games was excellent, and that could very well be the most important thing he does in the series is is guard Brunson because somebody has to. Uh, and he and he and Nick Batum have really split those duties and, and done a great job for the most part. Um, but also he gives them upside offensively that, you know, Lowry is great, but. I believe has only scored 20 plus points with the Sixers once. Batum has only done it once and it was that play in game. Um, you know, Buddy Heald might be on his way out of the rotation. Mm. Uh, you know, you never know with campaign and obviously he was huge in game three, but um, you know, as far as which Sixers role player, and I'm not even mentioning Tobias for the reasons that, that I just elaborated on a few minutes ago. Um, I think, I think if you're looking at one, you know, sort of Sixers supporting cast guy, to step up for the rest of this series, uh, particularly on offense. I think Ubre is that guy. Makes sense because Ubre has that intangibles that you mentioned, not only defensively, but offensively as well. And we saw that in game three, you know, from a Knicks perspective, um, don't like, it's nice to see Brunson get going. Like I said, it gives me confidence moving forward from the role players perspective, you know, OG stepped up in game three. I know defensively we can we can give OG a lot of praise on this side, but offensively is where we also needed him too. And he showed up in a big way, seven for 12 uh, from the field in the last game, showed his efficiency once again. And being that knockdown three-point shooter, which the Knicks need. The Knicks need to, to keep up with this hot Sixers team for, because – and I, I guess I should say to keep up with really Embiid and Maxi, who have been so hot this series scoring-wise – Knocking down threes is critical for this New York Knicks team just because, look, I know this team can get inside. They love to score in the paint. They love to do all of that. But three-point shooting is going to be vital just because of how prolific both those guys, Embiid and Maxi, that is, as scores. So three-point shooting is very important. So the Knicks got to continue to do that. And they'd be getting it from, like I said, OG did a good job. Wish he got a little bit more from Dante. You're going to need some from Boyan as well. Uh, McBride has been stepping up. Josh Hart has just essentially been that second scoring guy. He's just been phenomenal. He's Josh putting Hart up numbers. Josh like, against the Sixers. It's incredible. I know. He he he. Regular season, I was like, this guy's going to have a good series because regular season averaging 48% uh, percent shooting uh, field goal percentage, you know, getting, uh, I think, over 10 rebounds per game and then averaging 14 points. This guy was primed to have a solid series against the Sixers, and he's been doing just that. But I, it's everybody else. You off, But I wrote before the series that I thought Josh Hart could reach, like, peak Marcus Smart levels of wow. Sixers fans. and. Mm. You know, I, I don't I don't think the uh, I don't think the Marcus Smart Celtics and Knicks ever played in the playoffs because a lot of those years were were Knicks rebuild years. But Knicks fans certainly know how annoying Marcus Smart can be when he's at his best. And and I and so I, I wrote that and I was pretty confident in it, but I did not see four threes in, the, in each of the first three games of the series. It's, it's really incredible what he's done. 
uh, as a shooter and and obviously the rebounding is is you know I feel like what he's most known for in the mm-hmm. defense at this point. Um, yeah, I, I I've always I've always been a Josh Hart guy. A lot of people here always have been, given the Villanova ties and whatnot. Um, a lot of people here were upset when they didn't draft him. Mm. Uh, and and I think I saw a quote from him a few days. He ago. was upset. Yeah, he said that he was well, upset too. Um, they took they took a draft and stash center over him. Uh, named Anzesh Prasechniks, who never what, played. What happened to that guy? <laughs> he played He played like 15 games for the Wizards a couple years ago at the end of the season, and that's the extent of his NBA experience. Uh, meanwhile, the Sixers would love to have Josh Hart now, obviously. But, uh, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, no, yeah, I'd say Hart has been, has been so good, and I thought he was going to be really good and impactful, and he's even blown my expectations away. Yeah, he's been he's been vital, and we need his scoring output and his rebounding because he's not only our best rebounder, and he's also the second best scorer on this team right now. He's been the most consistent scorer in this series, but with him, Brunson, uh, honestly, at this point, I know there's there's been a lot of talk on how to guard Maxi and how to guard Embiid and the switching between because OG right now has been taking on a brunt of that Maxi matchup and trying to follow him around the perimeter and. Some are saying that without OG being in the front court to help and assist, you know, just making sure that, you know, you can double and beat at least in the paint. Uh, that would probably be more beneficial than having him chase Maxi. But I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough question for me because I think you have to leave on Maxi because I think he provides the wingspan. I know he doesn't necessarily have the quickness. Not a lot of people do have the quickness outside of McBride, who's pretty solid, is staying in front of Maxi. But there's a reason why we need Deuce coming off the bench because he's been providing solid scoring off the bench and he's just providing solid scoring. And then it's just to relieve Brunson for a little bit here and there just from a playmaker standpoint. And McBride has really improved in that area. But I guess I'm going to ask you, would you see, do you think that there would be a difference if OG was in the front court doubling and be, let's say, helping Hartenstein and doubling and bead versus leaving him on Maxi? Um, I think there would definitely be some benefits to that. Um, but like you said, I, I like I also think OG is their is their guy who's best equipped to defend Maxi. Um, like you said, like, you know, there are probably you could probably count on one hand the amount of guys in the NBA who have foot speed similar to Maxi. It's, it's watching him go up and down the floor is ridiculous. And especially he's like, a blur. Like, oh my God, he's incredible. I was actually, you know, I was uh at for during game i believe it was game one uh which i forget which game it was but one of the first two games of the series at msg um i was in the like uh the chase bridge or whatever it's called up there yep. which is where some of the media seating is and i was very close to this group of knicks fans who like every time the knicks took a shot they thought it was going in every time the sixers took a shot they thought it was going to miss every time two players bumped into each other they thought it was a foul on the Sixers, like, you know, very like Homer fans, as you would imagine at a, at a playoff game. But like every time Maxi did something, these guys were just like absolutely stunned by it. Um, and that's kind of the effect he has on people. Um, I think in part because he's so small, like just the way that he manipulates defenses and the shooting and the speed and the step backs and the layups and the floaters, it, he's just turned into such a ridiculous offensive player. Um and, and I forget if I cut you off in the middle of something, so I apologize. But um, yeah, it's it, that's that's kind of the the kind of the crux of the Sixers' offense, though, is that you want to load up to deal with the power of Embiid, and then the the sort of finesse speed game of Maxi comes right at you, and and that's why those two have been so good together for for a few years now, especially this year, both making the All Star team and. I believe they were the highest scoring duo in the NBA on a, on a per game basis before Embiid uh, went down. And, uh, and, and what was really exciting from a Sixers perspective about the, the really particularly the third quarter of game three. And I asked Tyrese about this after the game was that that felt like the first time in the series where Embiid and Maxi were both at a group at the same time. Like game one, you know, it was Embiid early and Maxi late. And then game two, again, it was kind of they were taking turns. And and they're at their best, obviously, when both of those guys are going well at the same time and playing off each other. Um, and I think your question, because it's a great question, I think it speaks to kind of the, the difficulty that the Sixers want opposing defenses and coaches to have with, with that kind of thing is like 
how do you not take a you know a wing as big and strong and sturdy as OG and want to use him to help you know against a seven foot two hundred eighty pound back to the basket center? But then if you do that, you're taking your best defender off a point guard who just averaged you know twenty six games twenty six points a game this year, I believe, who made his first All Star team, who can blow by just about anyone, but could also shoot over the top of anyone. So uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, Part of part of the beauty of what the Sixers have with those two is that I don't know if there's an alignment that is necessarily going to work for the Knicks. Like, I just I don't think that they can stop that duo uh, for too long, the same way that Nurse said, you know, we weren't going to be able to stop Jalen Brunson for an entire series. I think it's a similar dynamic. So it's going to be interesting to see if Tibbs sticks with OG on Maxi. My guess is he will, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see more chances for whether it's, you know, I know, I know Josh Hart doesn't, you know, is not the, the same caliber of athlete that Maxi is though. Like I said, most people aren't, um, whether it's more Josh Hart, whether it's even, you know, DiVincenzo gets a chance on him, whether it's Deuce off the bench. Uh, I think, I think it'll be interesting to see how they handle that because I, I totally agree that having OG available to help against Embiid would be quite a big help, especially if Mitch Rob is going to miss any time in the series, because mm-hmm. that's, you know, there's going to, if that's the case, there's going to be a time where Embiid and Precious Achua match up against each other. And that's a really, I mean, Embiid is a tough assignment for anybody, but especially for, you know, six foot eight Precious Achua. Um, so yeah, it's good. That's, you know, I, I, I could see Tibbs making a switch at the same time, there are potential downfalls to doing it. So I think it kind of, like I said, it speaks to, uh, you know, the versatility that the Sixers have with those two guys. For sure. And that's why it's been difficult to watch as a Knicks fan standpoint, because you say, how do you stop the, it's like, if it's not, if it's not Embiid, then it's Maxi. If it's not Maxi, it's then Embiid. And it's just, it's true. Thunder and lightning. Like, yeah. Embiid provides the thunder. Maxi provides the lightning and it's just tough to, to cover. So interested to see, I think that's one of the biggest things. And then I think to your point, and you know, the news has been out today, as you said, Mitch didn't practice today. Uh, questionable for game four we'll see what happens tomorrow uh whether or not he's able to play or not but for the Knicks if you don't have Mitchell Robinson I can see I could see Tibbs going with OG in the front court just to provide some support and to alleviate Hartenstein because it's foul trouble right and it's, yeah. it could be for any center and that's just kind of what Embiid's good at is drawing contact getting to the free throw line and the last thing you need is just Hartenstein to be completely left on an island without getting any support from Mitchell Robinson, who was, as you said, arguably one of the pivotal players in changing the outcome of game one. And so if he's not going to be there, maybe Tibbs does go in that direction to provide Hartenstein or maybe even pressure some support with OG out on the floor. But then it's like, does that change how Deuce is deployed? Because then he's the other guy that can stay with Maxi at least. So it'll be a whole interesting, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question to see unfold in tomorrow's game four matchup without knowing what's going to happen to Mitchell Robinson. But, you know, man, I'm looking forward to it. And it's like, I know Nick, some Knicks fans are also nervous as well. And it's just like butterflies in your stomach. I'm, I'm waiting for, I mean, I'm waiting for yeah, game four. Man. I want to see Thanks. what happens. And thank God it's a one o'clock game. Cause I, it's like, I, I can't wait for seven o'clock. It's like, you're trying to, it's like, do I want to rip the bandaid off right now? Do I, yeah. is, 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 just let's get it. Let's get it started. I want to see everything yeah. rocking early yeah. to be uh, yeah. uh, from the get go. But Adam, before I get you out of here, I got to ask you, um, I got to ask you one more question on this series, right? How important is it for like I? It's obviously winning any playoff game. We could they're all important, right? You got you got to win games in order to get on to the next round. I know it's a silly question, but yet we ask it anyway. So how? But how important is it for the Sixers to win Game Four? Is it the same pressure as Game Three because it is home court? You know the Knicks are up two one. Knicks win tomorrow. You put yourself in an even deeper hole. Do you think that they come out with that same type of mentality? Because I know from a Knicks standpoint, they're looking to get back on track. You know, they want to make sure that they can go home. Obviously, you want to finish the series in in the fewer amount of games as possible. They want to come out there, win tomorrow, go home, ask the square guard, and then call it a day. And what better way would it be for any Knicks fan than to see their home than their their team to win on home court? But how important is it for Philly tomorrow? Is it the same pressure as game three? Um, 
It's definitely similar. And, and in part, like you said, like, you know, obviously it doesn't even need to be said that every playoff game is huge for, for both teams, no matter, you know, what, what game of the series it is, what the series, you know, has been so far, but um, I guess maybe a little bit less just because it's conceivable to come back from a three, one deficit. Like we've seen, we've seen that before and we've actually never seen someone come back from a three Oh deficit. Um, so I, I really felt like the Sixer season was on the line in game three in a way that mm. I don't entirely feel is the same, but in game four, but, you know, winning three games in a row uh, with two of them being at Madison Square Garden against a 50 win Knicks team that, you know, might have had an even better record than that, obviously, if not for all the injuries they had throughout the year, um, that would be really, really tough. Um, I, you know, I, I predicted before the the series, like, gun to my head i would say nixon seven and as we sit here now i i actually even though they're down two one I, I i have a little more faith in the sixers than i did before just after seeing how good Embiid looked in game three and seeing that he's capable of of playing that well um if i had to guess uh i think the sixers defend their home floor tomorrow and mm. get a win um though I still probably lean Knicks in seven, I would not be surprised if the home team wins every game in this series, mm. which, you know, obviously both teams have historically had a great home court advantage, though the, the Knicks home court advantage was a little more uh, impactful than the Sixers, uh, you know, over the first three games of the series, but um, which, which that was really incredible the way that, that Knicks fans showed up for, for game three. And, and I'm sure it'll be something similar tomorrow. Um but yeah, it's obviously it's obviously it's crucial just from the simple fact that it's a playoff game and they're down to one. Um, I think it'll be a lot easier for the Sixers to get over the heartbreak, especially that came with, you know, the last 30 seconds of game two. Mm. If they can take care of business on their home floor and say, you know, they did what they had to do. We did what we had to do. And now, you know, it's, it's essentially a best of three. Um and, and, you know, part of the reason I was so excited for this series and it's, and it's delivered so far is that it really feels like, like, it, like based on the way these first three games were played, like, I feel like the Knicks could easily be up 3-0. The Sixers could easily be up 2-1. Uh, obviously, in, in reality, the Knicks are up 2-1. And there's even a world where the, where the Sixers are up 3-0 if they, if they figured out how to not give up an offensive rebound after every single Knicks miss in game <laughs> one. So, uh it's uh it's been fun and and you know i think we're gonna get a lot more intense basketball i really would not be surprised if this series goes the distance uh even regardless of what happens tomorrow um but yeah it's it's been it's been a lot of fun so far and i'm anticipating it being a lot of fun moving forward yeah i mean it's been it's been a tough matchup you know it feels like we're getting a, a second round or third round matchup in the first round Absolutely. by the just because of how things played out for both teams um it's going to be interesting one tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. And I think what you said at the end with rebounding is going to be the critical portion for either team who can control the glass. And that's essentially what will determine the winner of each and every game moving forward. Adam, I appreciate you coming through uh, today. Please let the listeners know where they can find you. If you got any upcoming work, we should be on the lookout for. Yeah. Um, I am at, at Sixers Adam on Twitter. Uh, or x whatever whatever it's called these days uh, <laughs> you can you can find me there uh and uh you know i'll tweet out all my writing from there uh certainly as soon as it's up but also uh phillyvoice.com uh if you want to if you want to find all my writing in one place you can find it there um you know i've got preview stuff before each sixers playoff game and uh instant observation stories after and then next day stories based on quotes and press conferences and themes from the game um you know, if you want to read anything I've written on the first three games of the series uh, or even stuff previewing the series that, that still somewhat holds up, you can. And uh, had a mailbag today that I mentioned earlier, uh, got, you know, keys to game four going up tomorrow morning and then an instant observation story after the game ends. And then I'm sure I'll have a couple things Monday. It's a busy time, but but I enjoy it. So, uh, you know, if you want, you know, I'm sure this is mostly Knicks fans listening. If you want, uh, you know, not not a fan's perspective necessarily, but the but the Philadelphia perspective of things. Uh, you know, certainly would love to have you reading and following along. And don't worry about that. We got we got a strong supporter, strong support system that's all about basketball, loves reading about basketball and getting both perspectives 
on uh, how this matchup goes. But Adam, thank you once again for coming through. And that is Adam Aronson. You can find him over at the Philly Voice. He is the beat writer that covers the 76ers for them. So make sure to go check out his work and support over there. And thank you, Knicks Nation, to, and to all the listeners tuning in. I know we got some Sixers fans tuning in here. We see you in the comment section. We know we got some Sixers fans tuning in. And I'm nice. sure we got some more tuning in because we got Adam on the show as well. So thank you all for tuning in and listening to this Game of the Week preview previewing game four of the Knicks versus the 76ers. You already know what to do. Hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match. And look, look, everybody, if you want to go have fun, don't worry, it doesn't end here. We got watch parties. Of course, we, if you're in New York, we got the watch party at Sucker Punch. So make sure to go over there if you want to go hang out with Knicks Nation and go support the Orange and Blue as they take on the 76ers tomorrow for game four at 1 p.m. Uh, make sure to get there beforehand, obviously. And then you got, don't worry, CP. CP is going out to Philadelphia. If you want to go catch the Knicks and go to the watch party, pregame brunch at the Winston in Philadelphia. Make sure to go over there tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. So if you want to go hang out with CP, get your brunch swag on and go cat and go get some eats in before the game starts. Make sure to go over to the Winston prior to. So make sure to tap into that as well. And look, thank you all once again for tuning in for another game of the week preview. We'll catch you later. We out.